a slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees, rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. Welcome to another episode of Sunday Morning Poetry. This is the Troubadour Podcast. I'm Kirk Barbera. And today we're going to go over the Lucy poems. So if you've been following along, you know that I've read through and explored with you four out of the five traditional Lucy poems by William Wordsworth. Now, the reason that I talk about them in that manner is that Wordsworth himself did not call them the Lucy poems. They were simply published in the lyrical ballads, particularly in the 1802 volume two of the lyrical ballads. And they were later categorized as the Lucy poems. And I wanted to explore them individually before we looked at them as a totality, because there's a lot you can understand and learn about the power of poetry, what it does, and how it's such a high art form. The Lucy poems, along with many of the Wordsworth poems, I would call sublime. And there's a lot that's been written about the sublime in art. And, and sublime essentially means a, a, something beautiful that inspires or, or engenders awe in the viewer or the reader in this case. So the poems that we've been covering, now if you haven't read them with me so far, that's okay. This one individual episode will briefly cover, I won't read all of them, um, but I'll read snippets of all of them. And the focus of the one that I just read, I, I, the one that began this episode, is called A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal. And this is the fifth Lucy poem. Now in this poem, um, which we'll talk about in a second, I think it's very, it's the shortest of all of them, I believe. It sums everything up and it gives you, or it kind of gives you a, a sense of the force of these very um, specially chosen words to convey what Wordsworth is trying to convey. And when taken as a whole, when you take all of these strange fits of passion, have I known, was the first one we explored. And we explored she dwelt among the untrodden ways and we explored a slumber or excuse me, a slumber did my spirit. So was the last one or the one I did today, three years in sun and shadow. Did she grow? And I traveled among unknown men. Those are the five Lucy poems. If you go to troubadourmag.com, I'll have a post that goes over that has this one and also has all of the other Lucy poems that I've gone over. Before that, we went over William Wordsworth's Matthew poems, Two April Mornings and The Fountain. And we explored what is he trying to do individually with these and why does it matter that, they put, that he puts them together? So before we get into the Lucy poems overall, let's real, do a real quick exploration of A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal. So when we're talking, so when we think about this, a slumber did my spirit seal. We're thinking something. So all we know at this point is that there's some kind of spirit. It's his spirit. And there's a seal, right? There's, there's a closure on it and it's closed by a slumber. And in this slumber, I had no human fears. And then we get this, this image of either he's talking about him, the narrator himself, or in this case, He's actually talking about sealing a lover, right? Putting, putting this lover in a coffin where no human fears are re relevant. Now, that's not an, an assessment you can get just by reading the first two lines. This is why I say you have to read a poem from beginning to end before you start to think about what it means. It's just not, for most poems, it's almost impossible because the totality, if it's a work of art, the totality is the key to understanding each individual 
uh, word, sentence, phrase, stanza, etc. This is true of paintings too. Like you, you can analyze a character in a painting, but you really need to understand the totality in order to get a, a sense of that character, of that, um, um, how the character fits into the whole and what the purpose of that whole is and what the whole, W-H-O-L-E, is saying about this character. And this is true in literature. I mean, if you take out a character in a book, it just doesn't make as much sense if you take that character and put them in a different storyline. Like it makes sense in the story that's being told in the way that it's being told. So that's the, the poetry is even more clearly like that. So many times you have to read the totality to get any sense of what's going on. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. So this first stanza, we get that there's some spirit being sealed up in a slumber. And of course, death is like a slumber, except the difference between a slumber is you can dream and have nightmares. In this slumber, you can't. I had no human fears. So I have no human fears could be about the person in the coffin, or it could also be that I no longer fear for this person. So that's one of the things we don't think about when the, we lose somebody. When you lose somebody you love, you or before you lose somebody you love, you may have fears that something bad will happen to them. You fear that they might get hit by a car, you, that you might, you know, miss them as their plane goes down. I mean, these are horrible things. They could get sick. They, I mean, a whole bunch of things can happen. And these are things that you have anxiety about when you're in love with somebody, or you may have some anxiety about. What would I do if this person passed away? But once they've passed, you don't have those human fears anymore. You don't fear for them anymore. You're sad. You long for them. You want them back. But the fear of something bad happening to them is gone. And now she, she's sitting there, she's laying there in this coffin, and she seems like a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. She can't feel anything anymore. No motion has she now. And we're getting, you know, motion, this, uh, Wordsworth was a big fan of Sir Isaac Newton. He went to Cambridge, and, um, you know, there, there's some descriptions of him at his, um, you know, chambers and he's, he's walk or he walks the Cambridge grounds and he, he looks up and he sees the statue of Sir Isaac Newton. And he's enthralled by this man. He was, a, um, at the beginning of his academic career, he was astute student. As he, he progressed, he went farther and farther away from that and more and more into just focusing on poetry. But nevertheless, he was a very astute student and he was in awe of Sir Isaac Newton. And you'll see a lot of, um, in, in the Lucy poems and elsewhere, a kind of Newtonian phraseology, even the motion diurnal course, which is an astronomy term, you know, it's Latin, but it's also used in astronomy often force. So we have, you know, two objects and equal force and so on. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Rolled round in earth's diurnal, co diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. And I think that those last two lines are worthy of really putting Wordsworth on the map in and of itself, although he's done thousands of great lines, or hundreds at least. But what, I mean, if you really start to think about putting someone in the earth and then, you know, moving yourself almost in a godlike uh, view of this whole situation. And you see now that the, the skeleton of the body of the woman is in earth. It's in the earth now. And it's part of the diurnal earth. Diurnal is like day. It's relating to the day. It means, you know, the way it, and it really refers to the way that the earth's, um, you know, tra rotates. So the earth is rotating. That's how we get a day, right? And, but you get a sense of all these, you know, mechanisms and things that are going on in the earth. And this body is now a part of all that. And it's just rotating around out in space and just rotating. And in that rotation is now this dead lover. 
And there's, there's a relationship between now she's part of nature. And this is something that we've talked about in the last one that I did, which was three years she grew in sun and sh- uh, sh- shower. And we'll talk about that again. But, you know, she has herself, there is no inner motion, right? That's how we can distinguish that someone is alive or dead, is that there is an inner force among them, not anymore. Now she's part of the force of the spiraling earth that's going around, and she's, you know, rolled around in earth's diurnal, diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees, you know, inanimate and, and uh, living things, but of a different sentience than ourselves. And she's sealed up in this thing. And it's a spirit sealed in. And there's, there's this sense of a, you know, almost a religious, but a scientifically religious aspect to this. A slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. Now, why is this one a Lucy poem? What is relevant about that in regards to Lucy? So, one of the things, if you did watch the early episode of this, the first one where I covered strange fits of passion, I have known, which, you know, in that one, we have a lover who associates the moon to, um, you know, to the woman that he loves. And he's on a journey in the middle of the night to go see his, his um, woman, his girlfriend, his lover. And he gets in this kind of trance-like state. He feels that the moon is similar to her. And he starts to see the moon descending and descending and descending and descending. And then all of a sudden it drops. Right, he, and it's like that, and then he has this fear that what if he should get to the cab- cabin, the cottage, and Lucy be dead? So that that makes sense. Why that's a Lucy poem? He says Lucy in in that poem. She dwelt among the untrodden ways. That one is associated in the um, in the ver- um, right afterward. He mentions uh, the, the, she dwelt among the untrodden ways. And this one does not mention Lucy. Oh, excuse me. Yes, it does. This only a slumber did my spirit seal not mention Lucy. So why is a slumber did my spirit seal? Is it traditionally thought of as a Lucy poem? And that's kind of what I wanted to explore in this poem, poetry today. And the, the lesson that we want to talk about today. And the message that I have for you guys in listening to this and exploring poetry, and I hope that the reason you're listening is that you're trying to expand your horizons when it comes to the exploration of literature and life. One of the things that poetry does is that it invigorates, it expands your consciousness, and it makes life worth living. But I cannot tell you that. There's no way to just convey that by saying those words. You know, it invigorates your life. It awakens your mind. It makes you look at the world. All of those are just cliches that don't mean anything. They're just sounds that come out of my, the hole in my mouth. But the only way for you to understand this is to read the poems. You have to read it for yourself. The poetry, you know, every poetry teacher understands or should understand that the only way to teach somebody poetry is through poetry. That's why on this Sunday morning poetry, I try to read a new poem every week and explore it a little bit with you to help give you the ability to do it on your own. So you can kind of get a feel for what it's like and then do it on your own. But you need to explore some of it on your own. And I hope that you will kind of get that from this particular episode. So what, one thing that we've lost, and that this is such a challenge for me and for teachers today, but I want you to feel that this is a loss, is that you probably don't know how to read. And I don't, you know, I mean that as a tragedy, not as an accusation. 
It's a tragic experience in our life that we actually don't know how to read. And part of this, and this is a failure of education, we were not taught how to read. And I don't just mean read poetry. I mean read. We don't know how to lift up the spirit of the words to look at the connotations, the analogies, the metaphors, the similes, the meaning behind the words, to question the meaning, to see if these were organized in a well-thought-out manner. And poetry is the best form of this. Poetry is the ultimate form of organizing thoughts, emotion, and all the power of what language can do, which is how you think, how you act, how you feel, how you communicate. This is all what, this is what language is, and poetry is the stuff of that. So it is the stuff of life. It's what, it's the matter of life. If we think about, there's the physical matter out in the world, right? There's atoms and all the molecules of the world that, you know, together combine and make the, the houses and the rocks around us, you know, or the material for the houses, I should say, and, and how we, you know, get the, the sludge out of the ground and we, we churn it up and, and spin it, the, the molecules from, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, carbon or whatever, and we, we spin that into plastics and use it in, and turn it into fuel and all these amazing things we're able to do. That's matter in uh, external to ourselves. And our bodies are made out of matter. But that isn't what matters. Or it's not, what, it's not the ultimate thing that matters. What really matters is how we see it and how we organize it in our minds. And that's what poetry does, is it organizes the language of your mind. On a broader scale, I believe it was T.S. Eliot who said that the purpose or one of the societal purposes of poetry is to purify the dialect of the tribe. And I think there's something to that. I think there's something where when you read poetry of a certain era, you get a sense for how those, that those people thought. So for instance, when you read Shakespeare, one thing you may not, if you've read it, one thing you may not have noticed are all the traitor terms he uses. England was just coming into, you know, a kind of a renaissance it was coming out of the middle, the, the medieval times. I mean, you know, the, the dark ages, it had been out of the dark ages for a little bit, but it was really just slowly getting into a better place. And you'll see words like summer's lease in the, um, um, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And you'll see those kinds of terms about trading and, and Iago is all about that. He's questioning the value of, of gold and, and its worth in our lives and things of that nature. And, I think in a, in a negative way, he's an evil character in Othello. But the point is that you'll see those terminologies, you'll see the words that he uses, which are words that are being coined by Shakespeare and other people at that time. And that is kind of a solidifying of that culture. And you get the traitor culture, you, you know, in some of these plays in Shakespeare's time, you get the sense of the what worried them, like the Moors, which were the Muslims who were coming up and they were conquering the whole world. Not only does it purify the dialect of the tribe or, or, or um, clean it up, not only does it, it solidify it so that we can see it in a solid sample, like a DNA sample of a society, but it also enhances, elevates, expands that, the, the dialect of the tribe. And that's a societal thing, you know, uh, uh, relevance, but it's also relevant for your own individual thinking and how you think, you know, people do not have the ability to think in metaphors, similes, analogies as they once did. And another thing that we lose is the, we're, we're cut off today from thousands of years of a literary tradition that have explored the morality, the spirit of humanity. And so, when on Wordsworth's time, before he wrote the lyrical ballads, and you'll see this in other romantic poets of his time, the idea of allusions, you know, talking about Milton or, you know, planting something about Virgil, um, the Aeneid or Homer's The Odyssey or The Iliad, planting little myths from Greece was a, it was a playful thing. And sometimes they would even quote, uh, you know, or, or like steal something from Cooper or John Donne and just put it directly in there. And the educated mind at that time 
thought of that as a pleasant appearance because it was like identifying, oh, I know that person. That's John Donne. Or, oh, that's Col Col Cooper. Or there's Shakespeare. There's Milton. Right. And there's, there's a kind of pleasure in seeing that. It's almost like Easter eggs in the MC in the Marvel Cinematic Universe world where people are so excited when they catch an, a, an Easter egg. That's how it was, except with something important in life like Milton. So when you, so that's one thing that we've lost is that we don't have the ability of illusion and, and really experiencing illusions without, you know, having to like, what is happening? I've none of this makes any sense. And then you have to have someone like me explain it, you know, which can be very esoteric and boring versus if you would have been in a proper education system, you would have a foundation in the Greek myths. You would know, have read the Odyssey and the Iliad. I mean, that's that should be required reading, if anything is, and, and the Aeneid and some Ovid and some Horace. And then, you know, even going forward and going into some of the English metaphysical poets and then the romantic poets and then, you know, the, the classic or the, the um, you know, modern poets. And then, you know, if you have to, I guess, and, you know, maybe not, ha maybe not um, read these guys, but the, you know, the uh, new, more contemporary poets. So today when a an author w were to, you know, cut out a section of Milton and put it into his work, instead of being excited by trying to catch those illusions, people just call it plagiarism. That's all it is today. And we've lost that, that sense of excitement at seeing a piece of work that we know and, you know, that we've read about and we've studied ourselves. Now, the reason I'm talking about this and the loss of education is because I, uh, over the last several weeks, have gone over these five Lucy poems with you for a variety of reasons. But one of them is, I hope that you will go back and revisit them. And in revisiting them, they will make a little bit more sense. And I'm going to give you a tip on if you enjoyed these at all and you're looking to expand your horizons in this, I will recommend a book for you. Now, I was at um, uh, the Objectivist Conference 2019 in Cleveland, Ohio. And, you know, I saw many of you there. So if you, if I did, Hey, how's it going? Cleveland Ocon peeps. And I hope mo many of you watch Lisa Van Dam's talk on literature and the quest uh, for meaning, as well as her talk on John Key's life and poetry. And one of the questions, and I don't remember which one it was, which session it was in, but one of the questions she got asked was if you wanted to read more poetry, what's an anthology that you recommended? I, I don't remember what, Lisa recommended. I have several recommendations myself, but after you know, this is assuming you've listened to all the Leonard Peikoff um, poetry lectures, which is only like one or two, all the Lisa Van Dam lectures that you can listen to, as well as read with me uh, bookgroup.com that she has. And then, of course, listen possibly to some of mine as well. And that'll get you a good start of, oh, let me explore these poems that I like. Again, if you don't like a poem, just skip it or, or, you know, you know, if you have to make your way through it and then find something that you really enjoy. But once you start getting a little bit of that, it just, there's such a taste. I mean, that's a teeny taste for what you can experience. But what we've lost besides illusions and understanding and the ability to read it all is the joy, the just pure joy of just having a well-crafted book of poetry crafted by the artist. So this is a book of poetry, um, Wordsworth and Col Coleridge, Lyrical Ballads, 1798 and 1802. So these are the um, versions that they published during that time. I, I don't, I'm not uh, an expert on, I, I, I don't remember exactly the editorial changes that these editors made, but for the most part, and what I've looked at, they're very similar to the actual publications that Wordsworth and Coleridge had. And these guys really thought about what they were trying to accomplish with their poems. This, and not just the individual poems, which they kind of agonized over a lot of times, or as, um, you know, the way that Wordsworth put it in the preface to the 1802 version, which is kind of his manifesto or one of his artistic manifestos, is he said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. Now, what he's 
you know, this is something we've explored in the, the other poems here. He's really interested in the state of feelings that we have, or the, the tracing the emotions we have or the connections we make in a state of excitement. And many of his poems take that flavor and strange fits of passion I have known or have I known is a really good example of that, where he's interested in when we're in this state of excitement, or, or in this case, a more key de- t- toned down state of being in a tranquil or um, hypnotic state, do we trace this exciting event, which is the death of his, or the thought of the death of his Lucy and its association with the moon, an external artifact, a thing in the, out in the world that he's, you know, he's looking at. So we get all this in the, these poems and they put a lot of thought. He put a lot of thought into the actual poems or, you know, the way he phrases it is he, um, the purpose of his poetry, and I'm paraphrasing what he's saying is the purpose of his poetry is to um, express a worthy purpose and quote from him in the preface, quote, not that I mean to say that I always began to write with the distinct purpose formally conceived, but I believe that my habits of meditation have so formed my feelings as that my descriptions of such objects as strongly excite those feelings will be found to carry along with them a purpose. For all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, but through though this be true, poems to which any value can be attached were never produced on any variety of subjects but by a man who, being possessed of more than usual organic sensibility, and also thought long and deeply. For our continued influxes of feeling are modified and directed by our thoughts, which are indeed the representatives of, representatives of all our past feelings. And as by contemplating the relation of these general representatives to each other, we discover what is really meant uh, important to men, so on and so forth. He goes on and on and on about this, about the the habits of men. And if you've ever read The Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand or Ayn Rand's um, uh, introduction to objectivist epistemology or her view of thought, this is really interestingly similar to that, that the purpose of poetry is that he's done all this thinking and associating and contemplating in his mind. And then, you know, from this, in a certain state of excitement, he has this overflow of emotion. And then he goes back and he recollects in tranquility and he crafts the words perfectly to make them precise. And this is this is how he, he operates. And this is based on his ability to organize organic sensibilities. I mean, this is this is why the sound and the meaning of words he thinks of them as organic, and I, I do too, in the sense that they come out, you know, like we don't know where words come from or where language started, right? It just, we think of humans as the thinking animal, but really one way to, another way to think about it is that they're the speaking animal. There's no other animal that can speak. Other animals may be able to communicate in some form, although that's even a uh, questionable thing. I, I don't think, you know, animals are actually communicating. I think they're uh, you know, they have certain instinctual reactions, like the zebra who gets startled. And then if all the others, that's, you know, and all the other zebras around get startled and they run away because there's a lion in the bush. It's not the same thing as communicating. That's a natural selection reaction that then leads to your survival if you startle easily like a zebra does. And I think this is true of pretty much all animals, that there's no communication, there's definitely no speaking, and there's no thought. This is a uniquely human thing, and so humans, in a sense, are the speaking animals, the talking ape. Now, they put a lot of thought, Coleridge and Wordsworth, into the poems, and they put a... This is the point I'm building up to. They put a lot of thought into the poetry book that they sold in 1798 and 1802 as well. And this is something that is lost today, is the, the ability to just pick up one of these books, developed, not, an antho- not a random anthology published today, but an anthology carefully selected and designed by the artist, and going out and reading it 
and exploring it from cover to cover. That is an experience that I think would is just absolutely breathtakingly interesting and um, a whole, you know, we think about like if you're into art, if you were at Ocon, you had, let's say your mind expanded a little bit about art and paintings and sculptures. If you went to Linda Cordaire's white glove tour and got to touch the different sculptures and you had your mind hopefully expanded a little bit, hopefully you appreciate the idea of going to great museums like Yaron Brook talked, talked about and seeing the great classical works that are on display, even though, as he put that, most of the great ones are actually in the basement, which is an unfortunate tragedy. And instead they have like a Jackson Pollock crap on, on you know, in a whole section of modern art, although they should get rid of the modern art and just put up this great work. But you, right here, with this book, you could buy this in 2019. You can have a museum or a great gallery of words in your hand right now. And you can go out and you can just go explore them, um, you know, through and through from the very beginning as somebody at that time would have in 1798. And this is, you know, um, this takes a little bit of work because you weren't educated the way they were you know, under, studying Latin and Greek, but it's worth it. And what's great about Wordsworth is that he is infinitely approachable. He's the easiest of, I think, many, in, in many ways, he's the easiest in terms of language of most of the major poets that I know of. Although there is a depth to him that is literally a, an infinite depth that you can explore forever and forever. Okay, so let me give you an example of what I mean get in regards to the Lucy poems. So this is, again, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, Lyrical Ballads, 1798 and 1802, Oxford World's Classics. Now, Strange Fits of Passion, Have I Known, was the first Lucy poem that we explored. What you may not know is that if you were to read this book together, this would be um, you know, as a whole, this is in volume two. So it's it's published in, in a sense on its own. And it's very early on in volume two. So it's called Lyrical Ballads with Pastoral and Other Poems, volume two in this book. And the first um, poem is The Heart Well, The Heart Leap Well. Now, we won't go into that one too much, but the what I want to get into is the poem that comes right before Strange Fits of Passion. Then there's, there's a pastoral poem, which is a kind of story, um, but told in a very specific way, which we'll explore in other times, perhaps. But there's a poem that comes right before it. So those have a particular theme, those, those poems before. But then all of a sudden we get into this ballad, a shorter, you know, it's, it's not a, it's a different style. The sound is different. It's a, a simple story. There's no dialogue like you get in the other ones, like the brothers of pastoral. There's, there's dialogue between this character and a, and a pastor. But in Ellen Irwin, or the Braes of Kirtle, a Kirtle is the, or the Kirtle is a river, you get a story of a beautiful young maid who is pursued by a knight named, named Adam Bruce. And she, of all the knights, she chooses Adam Bruce. But there's one um, knight, the fairest of them all, Gordon. And he becomes jealous. And this jealousy, proud Gordon cannot bear the thoughts that through his brain are traveling. And starting up to Bruce's heart, he launched a deadly javelin. And this is a ballad. This is, if you remember the when we covered ballads in the past, this is the sound of a ballad. Fair Ellen saw it when it came, and stepping forth to meet the same, did with her body cover the youth, her chosen lover. And then she dies. And you know she dies, and then of course Adam fights and kills Gordon. And then Adam is so enraged at life. And he goes off to Spain to fight the Moorish Crescents, which is the crescent moon from the, uh, the Islamic faith and the Moors were the, the Islam, uh, Islamists at the time. 
and he fights them and he kills them and he's just brutal and, and we expect or he expects and wants to die the death uh, this wretched knight did vainly seek the death that he was wooing but he didn't have it and coming back across the wave without a groan on ellen's grave his body he, his body he extended and there his sorrow ended and then the you know the final stanza is the narrator sa saying i tell you this tale you know cuz ballads are are traditionally from minstrels from troubadours going around and telling these stories with song lyrical ballads that's where this comes from and you know the idea is now ye who willingly have heard the tale i have been telling may in kirkenell church yard view the grave of lovely ellen and beside her is bruce and you know at, at the end you cannot no rude hand can, has ever touched or defaced this gravestone and it's forlorn hick jasset i'm not sure how to pronounce it Hasset. but it means here lies so you know here lies uh, bruce here lies um ellen so we get this idea of lost love of jealousy leading to murder and loss and then of course the longing in this case is for death right after that is strange fits of passion i have known so if you're really experiencing this lyrical ballads publication if you're sitting down there's no facebook and social media it's just you and a book and you're exploring it you're thinking about it, you're you're reading it again and again until you get it in your mind then you go into strange fit strange fits of passion Strange fits of passion I have known, and I will dare to tell. But in the lover's ear alone, what once to me befell. When she I loved was strong and gay, and like a rose in June, I to her cottage bent my way, beneath the evening moon. Upon the moon I fixed my eye, all over the wide lea. My horse trudged on, and we drew nigh those paths so dear to me. I'm trying to find it here so if you're watching. So if you're watching on Facebook, you can. I think I passed it. Ah, here it is. And now we reached the orchard plot, and as we climbed the hill towards the roof of Lucy's cot, the moon descended still. You may see some slight differences between what you're seeing on screen and what I'm reading. That's because I'm reading, I believe, the original publication. This is a later ed edit by the poet. And one of those sweet dreams I slept, kind nature's gentlest boon, and all the while my eyes I kept on the descending moon. My horse moved on, hoof after hoof. He raised and never stopped. When down behind the cottage roof, at once, the bright moon dropped. What fond and wayward thoughts will slide into a lover's head? Oh, mercy! To myself I cried, if Lucy should be dead. So in, that comes right after this story of Ellen Irwin, of, you know, being killed by a man who loves her. And it's said in the Ellen Irwin story that he loves her as much as Adam does. My Ellen was sad tidings to that noble youth, for it may be proclaimed with truth, if Bruce hath loved sincerely, the Gordon loves as dearly. They both, Adam, Bruce, and Gordon, love Ellen equally, but she just happens to choose Adam Bruce. And so in a fit of rage, Gordon throws a javelin at his, um, his opponent, Bruce, Adam Bruce, but Ellen jumps in the way and he inadvertently kills her. So we get this idea of an inadvertent murder of the one that you love, of killing the one that you love. And right after that, there's this strange fits of passion I have known. So my point is that these were chosen in the, the poems were chosen and designed in the order that they were. It's kind of like today we live in this era of um, iTunes and listening to single tracks. But in the past, if you've ever listened to an album, like a Beatles album, 
they designed it to, you know, um, to play one after the other in a certain manner. And often some of the better ones told a story and all, and the totality of it was, was kind of, they each could be their own single perhaps, but totally they, they made a story or, the, or they had an effect. And that's what Wordsworth and Coleridge are trying to do. After the strange fits of passion I have known is in this book is the poem, She Dwelt Among the Untrodden Way, another Lucy poem. So one way we identify a Lucy poem is it doesn't have a title. So these don't have titles in the publication, although Ellen Kerwin does have a title. It's called by Ellen Irwin, excuse me, or The Braze of Curdle. That's what Wordsworth called it. The Strange Fits of Passion I Have Known is just, you know, um, a quote from the first line. That's it. After these Lucy poems, the next poem does have a title. It's called The Waterfall and the Eglantine, which we'll talk about briefly. So she dwelt among the untrodden ways. So we get this Strange Fits of Passion I Have I Known, which is about this man who has a, a vision of his Lucy dying, which is a kind of horrible, repressed desire, possibly, of why did I have that thought? Why in this trance, this woman that I love, did I have this thought that she might be dead? Was it a fear or was it a hope? Was there something, you know, is there some part of me that is feeling a little trapped? And she dwelt among the untrodden ways beside the spring of do dove, a maid whom there were none to praise, a very few to love, a violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but she is in her grave and oh, the difference to me. So here we get a story of a woman, imagine her out in the woods in the middle of nowhere, and nobody knows of this woman. A, main who, a, a maid whom there were none to praise, a very few to love. So she's isolated. She's a violet by a, you know, think of moss. And you have this whole mossy area of just green moss and one violet, one beautiful purple flower, half hidden from the, from the eye. So you can't even see it, right? Because all you see is moss and there's one little flower that you might miss. She's fair as a star, but only when one is shining in the sky. So it's, you know, there's, there's a moss that's half hidden, but there's also a relation, a comparison to this violets or this uh, shining star, which is a very bright, hard to miss thing in the middle of the night. So he's comparing these two things that are very dissimilar. That's one thing that he's really good at, are these kind of comparisons and, um, you know, well, comparisons and finding similarities and just dissimilarities among things and differences. She lived unknown and few could know when Lucy ceased to be. So when she, she lived and nobody knew about her out in this cabin in the woods and nobody knew when she died, but there was a difference to him, this lover. So he's, we get a, another sense of this lover who's not close to the love. He's far away from the love. There is that sense of, it's, it's a feeling of longing that we're getting, right? Is she, people didn't know about her. Maybe he did a little bit, but the poem doesn't talk about him kissing her hair, you know, um, touching her skin, meeting her, talking to her. There's, there's none of that. There's just him, you know, um, thinking that there's a, there's a difference to, to him, but not to the rest of society. And that's the focus of the poem. And then, of course, the last poem in this little trilogy is um, in, the, in the publication that I'm talking about is a slumber did my spirit seal, which we talked about. So now we get like almost an acceptance. So there's like these three together, taken together really means something to the poet. There's something important that he's trying to express thematically. And we get this acceptance of Lucy being dead and almost a pride or a, a, um, a, a kind of a joy that she's among the diurnal course of this great, great earth that he loves. Now, after this, he had a poem that was not published, um, that was taken out at the last moment called I Traveled Among Unknown Men. Now, we discussed that one individually, but that would go right after here. And in I Traveled Among Unknown Men, 
we get the um, view. Let's see if we can find it here real quick. I traveled among, we get the view of an association of Lucy to uh, England and a reconfirmation to himself that, um, nor will I quit thy shore a second time. So he's never going to leave England again. I traveled among unknown men and lands beyond the sea, nor England did I know till then what love I bore to thee. Tis past that melancholy dream, nor will I quit thy shore a second time, for still I seem to love thee more and more. Among thy mountains, your mountains, did I feel the joy of my desire. And she I cherished turned her wheel beside an English fire. Thy morning showed, thy nights concealed, the bowers where Lucy played, and thine too is the last green field that Lucy's eyes surveyed. So we learn here at the end that Lucy's eyes surveyed the last thing she saw were the bowers, the, the green fields, the mornings, the nights that concealed, all these English uh, countryside. And so that realization in the lover makes him, um, you know, that he's associating this, um, that this is where she, Lucy is, I'm not going to go away from this place ever again. So that's supposed to be four total to, taken together of the Lucy poems. That comes right after this idea of Ellen Irwin killing uh, um, being killed by her lover, right? Per like accidentally, but it's still by the lovers doing the killing. And that, you know, adds something to this Lucy character, that this Lucy character is someone who the strange fits of passion, passion narrator, you know, associates, what if she were to die? And I don't know if you've ever had that feeling of like, what if I'm driving this car and I screw up and I get in an accident and my girlfriend dies? Like, I don't know if you've ever heard you know, songs like that or had those types of thoughts, but there's, there's something, there's, there's a kind of fear. If you care about something and you think about that thing that can happen. I know parents think about this all the time. Like what if I screw up and I get my kid killed like that? That would be awful. Would I be able to overcome that? And a lot of times you can't, and he's exploring the, the uh, issue of death, but not just in the idea of a cessation of motion, but in all the associated uh, emotions that are regarded in that experience. You know, we get the longing for this person that's just out of reach. They're now gone because they're in the diurnal course. So these are the, the four. Now, after these poems, A Slumbered in My Spirit Seal, is a poem called The Waterfall and the Eglantine in this, this book that I'm reading from. Now, an I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but an eglantine, E-G-L-A-N-T-I-N-E, -E, is apparently a sweet briar or a, um, an Eurasian wild rose with fragrant leaves and flowers. Now, what we get in this little story is, again, this is another little ballad, but it's a, a very metaphoric ballad where you have a, a waterfall having a conversation with a wildflower. And the waterfall is swelled up from the recent snows and it's pummeling this wildflower, which you can just imagine this little wildflower is just getting killed by this, this whole uh, torrent of water. And the torrent of water is coming from the power of the mountain, you know, uh, uh, melting the snow and, and building up the swells of the river. So it's becoming more and more powerful, like a man. And the little... Um, Rose, or the little briar, says, uh, Why should we dwell in strife? We who in this, our natural, our natal spot, once lived a happy life. You stirred me on my rocky bed. What pleasure through my veins you spread. So the, the, the flower is then all of a sudden talking to the waterfall and saying, You gave me life before, and, and I love you for that. That did your cares repay, and I repaid your cares. When spring came on with bud and bell, among these rocks did I before you hang my wreath to tell that gentle days were nigh. And in the sultry summer hour, hours, I sheltered you with leaves and flowers. And in my leaves, now shed and gone, the linnet lodged and for us too chanted his pretty songs 
when you had little voice or none. So the the um, Sweetbriar is saying, when I was strong and you were just a little dry mud bottle, I took care of you. And not only did I take care of you in that time, but the song from the birds that came to me gave you pleasure and enjoyment and strength and power to build up so that you could become this powerful waterfall. And the last stanza, what more he said I cannot tell, the stream came thundering down the dell and galloped loud and fast. I listened, nor aught else could hear. The briar quaked, and much I fear those accents were his last. So it kills him. So in this case, we have again two friends or even possibly lovers who care about each other, who took care of each other in nature, but one grew too powerful and didn't care that the other one had helped it once and destroyed it. Right? So we get that kind of feeling in all these Lucy poems where there's almost a desire for the death. I mean, there's such a focus on it. You know, she, she, there's a love for the Lucy character. She's this character that you care about, but we know she's going to die. And, oh, she means a lot to me, but she was unknown her whole life. The moon descended and, and it dropped. And then I had this thought about her death. And now there's an acceptance that she's part of the diurnal course. So you get these, you get a kind of feel of these thematic similarities between these poems that really add a lot to the meaning of each individual poem. Now, another one that we will explore is Three Years She Grew in Sun, or that we have explored, I should say, Three Years She Grew in Sun and Shower. Now, there's a big gap between three years in sun and uh, three years she grew in sun and shower. And when, uh, so there's several poems before this or after those four Lucy poems. And then we get the Matthew poems, which I won't go into because it's just going to take too much time, but the, essentially it's just two April mornings is one poem. The fountain is another, and it's a, it's an experiment in or an experience of this, old teacher and a young you know pupil and they're exploring nature and the teacher gets a kind of revelation or emotional reaction to some mundane thing and it leads to this whole you know experience between the two that's very odd for them both and then after that so that's what happens but then after that we get a poem nutting and here's how nutting ends then, dearest maiden, move along these shades in gentleness, gentleness of heart, with gentle hand touch, for there is a spirit in the woods. The next poem is Three Years She Grew in Sun and Shower, which is about a young woman, a young girl who dies after only three years of life, and instead of just disappearing from the earth, you know, uh, from, from all existence, she becomes the bride of nature, nature or the, the tutor of, or she's tutored by nature and she becomes a, a bride of nature or a, a, a possible equal to nature in her own immortality. And she becomes that spirit that's in the woods. Now, in Nutting, the poem, we get this character, the narrator, who is a young boy and he, it's about education. He goes out into the woods and he's tricked out in proud disguise of beggar weed. So he's dressed like a beggar, but in a certain attire that's just kind of, you know, like leaves and flowers and weeds on, on him. Put on, a, put on for the occasion by advice and exhortation of my frugal dame. So a, a, a woman in his life, an older woman. Motley accoutrement of power to smile at thorns and brakes and brambles and, in truth, more ragged than need was. So then he goes among the woods and o'er the pathless rocks. I forced my way until at length I came to one dear nook unvisited. We're not a broken... So he goes into this area, this kind of Garden of Eden, not touched by man. And he has this moment. So we're getting this idea that he's, you know, going nutting, which is to get nuts. You know, he's going to, you know, get actual nuts to, you know, cracking walnuts and such. And they used to have a contraption to go nutting. And he... um he starts to have this moment of contemplation about, well, there's something beautiful and sublime and, and something important about this. And this is a young boy who's having this experience. Then, so he says, the heart, or, I heard the murmur and the murmuring sound. 
in that sweet mood when pleasure loves to pay tribute to ease. And, of its joy secure, the heart luxuriates with indifferent things, wasting its kindliness on rocks, on stocks and stones, and on the vacant air. Then up I arose, and dragged to earth both branch and bough, with crash and merciless ravage, and the shady nook of hazels and the green and mossy bower, deformed and sullied, patiently gave up their quiet being. And unless I now confound my present feelings with the past, even then when from the bower I turned away, exulting, rich beyond the power, the wealth of kings, I felt a sense of pain when I beheld the silent trees and the intruding sky. Then, dearest maiden, move along these shades in gentleness of heart, with gentle hand touch, for there is a spirit in the woods. So what he learned is that the, this inner thing that man has to tear down and make this thing his own, but, but he's not even like that. He's just a juvenile at this point. But that power, if you've ever read The Fountainhead, there's a desire by Howard, Rock to, Howard Rourke to crush the rocks, but he wants to, at this point, turn it into something because he's an adult. But this boy just tears, this, it's the raw power within him. He just tears stuff down and there's a hole in this you know, perfectly assembled um, Garden of Eden and now he can see the sky and it feels like it's being intruded on. So there's a lesson there. And what he learns is that there's a spirit in the woods. And then we get three years she grew in sun and shower. The nature said, three years she grew in sun and shower. Then nature said, a lovelier flower on earth was never sown. This child I to myself will take. She shall be mine, and I will make a lady of my own. Myself will to my darling be both law and impulse. And with me the girl, and rock and plain, and earth and heaven, and glade and bower, shall feel an overseeing power to kindle or restrain. She shall be sportive as the fawn that wild with glee across the lawn or up the mountain springs. And hers shall be the breathing balm and hers the silence and the calm of mute and sensate things. The floating clouds their state shall lend to her, for her the willow bend, nor shall she fail to see even in the motions of the storm grace that shall mold the maiden's form by silent sympathy. The stars of midnight shall be dear to her, and she shall lean her ear. And, I don't know if you saw that. Um, where was I? And she shall lean her ear in many a secret place, where rivulets dance their wayward round, and beauty born of murmuring sound shall pass into her face. And vital feelings of delight shall rear her form to stately height, her virgin bosom swell. Such thoughts to Lucy I will give while she and I together live here in this happy dell. Thus nature spake, the work was done. How soon my Lucy's race was won, run. She died, and left to me this heath, this calm and quiet scene, the memory of what has been and never more will be. So we're getting this idea of the spirit in the woods is brought up by nature and made into the spirit of the woods. And it's, it's part of the, the love of man is the, is the love of nature. That's a Wordsworth phrase. The love of man is the, comes from the love of nature. And he believes in a, in a, you know, he's, he is a, um, he, he, he does take it too far in my philosophical opinion, but he is, you know, somebody who really appreciates this love of, you know, what nature can do for man. And there is something to that because there's also something in the idea that since Wordsworth and, and since maybe because of Wordsworth to some degree, but since Wordsworth, we have really separated man from nature. And this is something that Karl Marx pointed out. Now, I think the reasons for thinking this is wrong, but there is a view today that we've separated that man is somehow not part of nature, right? Like the things that man does is not natural. 
So drilling for oil, unnatural. If a beaver cuts down a tree, that's natural. If a man cuts down a tree, it's unnatural. Now, the reason they say is because we do it too much. But that's just because we're a grander species. But that's another story. But the idea that everything we do is natural is gone from the earth. We don't have that view anymore at all. Although I think that's the, the, the real view, and I think that's Wordsworth's view, is that we are one with nature in a sense. Now, he would agree with the idea that we go too far, and, and there's a variety of reasons for that. We could talk about that at some other point if you're interested. But I wanted you to get a sense for the totality of these Lucy poems, how they all bleed into each other, that they were all chosen to be put in that location in the book for a reason. And you can enjoy them individually. But I encourage you to explore these books. You know, uh, Walt Whitman wrote the leaves, a book called The Leaves of Grass. That's what put him on the map. And he spent the rest of his life re-editing and editing and rearranging it. The Lyrical Ballads was published in a very thin little booklet in 1798. Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner was the first poem. This was a radical new thing that was being published. It was so radical. People had no idea. You know, it was from all of a sudden, you get normal sounding language that you might hear on the streets, at least in some form, though elevated, in a poem about grand epic stories like The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. But then in a later 1802 version, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner the rhyme of the, of the ancient mariner is put toward the end. And another one that's in another version is put in the middle. So he's tinkering with these, trying to get different effects. You know, and that and he's putting different poems in different places, and he's doing that to, to get an effect. And that is why it's so important to read these things. And I just wanted to end on a an idea of how radical this particular book was. The Lyrical Ballads, 1798. This launched the Romantic movement. So if you're interested in romantic, in romance, um, the, the Romantic movement, this is what's considered to have launched the English Romantic movement in particular. But what you get with this poem, and, or with these poems, is a, uh, like I said, a, a shift in the use of language in poetry. So it's no longer this super high pollutant, flowery language. It's, it's more the language of men. Wordsworth said that a poet is a man speaking to men. His goal was to speak to as many men as possible. Not to only the, the highest of high educated men. That if you didn't go and spend you know years at Cambridge, then you can't understand this. Even then, he didn't like that idea. And the next thing, um, that, and to help you understand how radical it was to do that, I, the, the only analogy or idea that I could come up with is just imagine that the next Marvel Cinematic Universe, the, the next Marvel movie, you know, I, it, here's a spoiler about Endgame. So if you haven't seen Endgame, you could stop here. Okay, I assume you stopped <laughs> if you haven't seen it. But if you know the ending, Tony Stark died. Now, we can imagine that at some point in the near future, they're going to reboot that character, I would imagine. So let's say they will. Well, let's imagine they rebooted Iron Man. But this Iron Man, who's, you know, he has to build up his character. We need his backstory again, let's say, or in some new version. But this, this Iron Man, he is in this universe. He's a billionaire. And he struggles with his desire to be famous and have honor, as well as his desire to um, do the right thing for individual people. And they often are at odds together where he, he will do things this one way and he explicitly understands this and he's fighting for these internal values where he's trying to be, a, he's trying to build his character between this famous, becoming a fame monger and an honor monger and, and these personal values of, of uh, P Pepper Potts and, and having a family or something, you know, or, and, and trying to build things because he loves the building of itself. And there's that value. And then most uniquely about this new story is that he speaks and all the characters speak like Shakespearean heroes. And they speak in that maybe a more modern version of Shakespeare's language, but the high flowery 
you know, to be or not to be and, and so on. You know, I don't know off the top of my head, but but th- but that kind of that kind of language. Just read a, a Shakespeare uh, soliloquy. And there, maybe there's a little just imagine that the Marvel, they spent a hundred million dollars on this movie and that's what they put, give to you. That's how dramatically radical this was is because before that there was, that language was the accepted Canon. And then all of a sudden there's like, wait, this is normal stuff. Now it's normal language. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it was a uh, normal language in the way that we have normal language. As you've seen, it's, it's different. The way he's thought of it as it's normal, you know, the, the normal language of men on the street, but rendered through the mind of a genius in, in the forged and, and elevated in the mind of a genius to have extraordinary thoughts. And that's what he was really going after. And I think, you know, that, that was his experiment. And I think he succeeded in doing that. And he, he has a very specific way that he approaches this. But the point is that it was very dramatic. It was also radical to have these stories about ordinary individuals, not just about kings and queens. So the reason that that's relevant is it gives you a sense for what, you know, it gives you one sense for what the romantics were interested in. They had this, you know, emotion was very important, but so was imagination. And they believed that every individual had that ability. This came from the time that they lived in. That's what the, that's what they were believing in at the time. I mean, it, it, before this was written, you get, you know, uh, men like Burke and you get Thomas Paine, The Rights of Man. You get these pamphlets, you get, the, you know, the, the French Revolution, but you also, of course, get the, the American Revolution. You get this idea that individual men have the ability to have high emotions and high lives, which, it, you know, Ayn Rand believed as well. Uh, Howard Rourke is an extraordinary hero, but he doesn't, he's not an extraordinary hero by heritage or by birth, or where he's from, or from rich parents. Same thing, you know, I think they said he was a gas station clerk at one point. And, and um, you know, John Galt, or maybe it was John Galt that was a gas station clerk. I don't remember, I get it mixed up. But John Galt is thought of as just kind of appearing, but from middle America. And and so that that's an important distinction and belief by Ayn Rand. Okay, so that's the Lucy poems. And, you know, we've gone through the Matthew poems, and, I'll, you know, maybe I'll do some of those poems that are around, you know, I'll, I'll I'll very likely do more from lyrical ballads. I think there's just so much there. There are, you know, I don't know, I mean, a hundred and some, a couple hundred poems there. I mean, it's just so much to explore. So if you're looking for something to explore, to get started, try the lyrical ballads. Just read through it, you know, ex- experience them. If you don't understand it, that's a, a poem. That's okay. Just move on or read, you know, reread it again and again. So I hope you enjoyed the Lucy poems and I'll see you next time on the Troubadour podcast. Thank you.